Hello everyone. My name is my name is Alex Headsmith. I am a mechanical technician here at the Science and Technology Technology Facilities Council at Darsby Laboratory. Welcome to our virtual tour, which will be led by our apprentices. I myself am an ex-mechanical engineering apprentice here, and I've worked here for the past five years. So this event is in collaboration with the IET, um, the Mersey and Western Cheshire Network Young Professionals Group. We are a group of young professionals who work together to promote STEM and outreach for STEM. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later on. Um, a quick overview of today's event is as follows. So Jonathan will start with an introduction to SCFC and the apprenticeship scheme. Following that will be the virtual tour, which will be hosted by Tom Kelly and will include a live feed from the Engineering Technology Centre. We will also have questions which will be taken at three points during the tour and straight after the tour. Uh, please use the Q&A function for all questions as that is the only question source we will be monitoring. And then at the end, we will have the CPD information and other relevant information um, that you may require. And with that, I will hand over to Jonathan who will give his talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex, that's great. Um, so Alex has invited me along this evening um, to kind of explain a little bit about uh, the wider apprenticeship offer, the SDFC. So just a few slides to kind of aid with discussions this evening, which just pop up for you now. Um, so just a little bit about myself, first of all, and sort of my role in um, the apprenticeship world at STFC. Um, so my role is Apprenticeship Scheme Coordinator for our Northern um, STFC sites. So that's here at Darwin Laboratory in Cheshire, but also the UK Astronomy Technology Centre based up in Edinburgh. But I don't do this by myself. Um, there's a team of us based across our main sites, which we'll talk a little bit about during the, during the next few minutes on the slides. And in, in summary, what, what my role is, it's looking after um, the, the, the apprentices across the site from, you know, before they even start the journey at STFC. So some of you may be thinking about doing an apprenticeship at STFC. I'm usually one of the first people you'll sort of engage with and speak to, um, right through to onboarding, interviewing, through your apprenticeship journey, and then beyond that into further development and further opportunities within STFC. So many of the people you're gonna hear from this evening, you know, Alex included, have been apprentices. Some of them are still still our apprentices, and some are embarking on their, their second apprenticeship within SCFC. So it's a it's a long term commitment within the organisation. So currently at STFC Darsbury, across all of our sites, we've got over 170 apprentices across lots of different roles and disciplines, uh, but predominantly within engineering because that's a bread and butter of what we do. And at Darsbury, we have um, over 60 apprentices um, supporting the work that we do. So the first thing that's always worth explaining, and it's something I get asked everywhere I go, any event, um, any meeting I go to, the first thing to say is, well, who are the Science and Technology Facility Council? And it's quite a valid question. I've got a very grand title, but it doesn't really explain what we do. So STFC, as we're abbreviated, we're, we're one of nine different research councils. We all come under one umbrella, which is UK Research Innovation, and we're funded through central government. Now, along with the other research councils you can see displayed on the slide here, what we're tasked to do is, is deliver quite an ambitious agenda on behalf of UK government, which is for the UK to become the most innovative country in the world in terms of science and to ensure the UK maintains its world leading position in research and innovation. So quite a grand ask of us. But each one of the research councils you can see on here is responsible for a different area of scientific research and development and driving forward development in those areas. So quick practical example, in the bottom right hand corner, you can see the Medical Research Council, it's fairly obvious what those guys are doing, obviously looking at new medicines, developments and treatments. And you've also got the Natural Environment Research Council. And, and these are the guys that are going out with the, you know, the huge ship that's going into the place like Antarctica, based in really wonderful parts of the world, doing some crucial research. Um, so it's to give you a sense of the scale of the science that we're involved with. Now, UKRI itself, it's got quite a, a hefty operating budget of over £7 billion per year. And UKRI's vision is to... Um, they develop an outstanding research and innovation system within the UK, giving everyone the opportunity to, to contribute, but everyone the, the opportunity to benefit from its work, whether that's locally, nationally and internationally. 
actually. So it is the UK's largest public funder of research innovation. So the UK has made some pretty hefty commitments to being a world leader in innovation, and it's committed to some pretty stretching targets to go alongside that. You know, for example, we're looking to get zero emissions by, by the year 2050, developing new and innovative cancer treatments, and ultimately generating a greener and safer and healthier future for everyone. So everything that UKRI is looking to achieve through its mission will have long lasting benefits to the UK economy and to UK society, which is why it does have a hefty public sector investment. So the Science and Technology Facilities Council then, um, we're, with the, because the UK is committed to this world leading innovation, it, all of it is underpinned by science and technology. You, you can't make these, these advances in, in, in science without the technology to support that. So what we do at STFC is we, we deliver frontier research in particle physics, astronomy, nuclear physics, and accelerator and space science. We also provide access to world leading large scale facilities for thousands of UK academics and industrial researchers. And the facilities we, we're involved with and the facilities we operate have lots of complex machinery involved. So anything from a, a synchrotron X-ray, neutrons and lasers, all of which involves quite innovative technologies, often at the very edge of what is actually possible in, in an engineering and technical sense. We also manage the UK's international science facilities subscriptions to big multi-million pound operations. That includes CERN, the world's most famous particle physics laboratory based over in Geneva, for example. So STFC to fit in with UKRI's vision has its own quite grand vision. Um, which is to discover the secrets of the universe. And it genuinely is that. It, it's, it sounds like we're making it up, but that's actually true. Um, to do that, we need to develop advanced technologies. So we support big science projects by building the technology that can't be built, you know, bought off the shelf. And by doing this, we're helping to solve some real world challenges. So we, we've all seen how important science and technology is, particularly over the last 18 months with COVID as a really obvious example. So STFC, for example, have been instrumental in using its facilities to help build three-dimensional structures of the proteins produced by the coronavirus. And that in turn has led to the development of, of, of inhibitor drugs and obviously the vaccines that we've seen rolled out quite successfully across the UK. Now to do all of this, we need a few things. First of all, we, we need access to the best research infrastructure like CERN, for example. We also need a team of talented people. So we need the scientists, we need the engineers, we need the technicians and every other member of staff supporting what those guys do as well. Now within STFC, there are a number of different roles and each one of these roles makes a major contribution to, to what we want to achieve. The problem we tend to find is that a lot of people don't see themselves working in, a, in an R&D sort of environment. And what I think doesn't help is the sort of the stereotypical image you might see when you think of R&D and science. You know, you might think of some lone genius, mad Einstein type of person in a dusty old white lab coat doing some obscure experiment. It just simply isn't the case. The, the people we're looking for at SCFC are you know, people who are just naturally curious. They've got a desire to understand things. They've got a desire to kind of fix problems and make things work, which are all just very basic human notions anyway. And we need a diverse range of people working in a diverse range of roles to drive forward progress in science and technology. Now tonight I'm going to hear from the guys as they talk you through uh, what the Engineering Technology Centre does here at Darsby Laboratory. Um, we do have more than one site within the UK. I've mentioned the UK Astronomy Technology Centre up in Edinburgh, which are producing lots of uh, site, uh, astronomy based technology for ground and space, uh, space based uh, science projects. We have our main site, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire which houses numerous different parcel accelerators and numerous different departments, including our uh, RAL Space Division, which is involved in lots of very exciting and, and very complicated space missions. Well, let's get back to basics. So what, what does Darsby do in all of this? Well, well, Darsby, for many years since it was established back in the 1960s, it's been known as the Engineering Centre of Excellence for various parcel accelerators using various applications. But you know, what is a particle accelerator? So some of you on this call probably got a really good understanding of what a particle accelerator is, way over and above what, what I understand a particle accelerator to be, but others may not. So let's just take it down to basics then. So a particle accelerator, it takes a charged particle, a proton or electron, for example, and accelerates that particle to close to the speed of light. Um, when you accelerate a, a particle to these high speeds, it contains a huge amount of energy packed into a really tiny space. You can then take those particles and you can smash them into a fixed target, 
or smash them against other particles that may circulate in the opposite direction within an accelerator. Now, by studying these collisions, what scientists are able to do is, is to start to investigate the world of the infinitely small. Now, the, you can also take the energy um, that's emitted from, from the particles when the accelerators and, and they're forced to emit their energy as light. What that then does is create intense X-ray lasers that can be then used to, as essentially really powerful microscopes, to look at things at a molecular level um, for various different applications. Now, there's about 30,000 different particle accelerators based across the world. Some of them are, are giant complexes, like CERN, for example. Others are much smaller, and you might find them um, in hospitals, for example, where they can, they can provide the intense X-rays that are required or even proton beams for, for treating cancer. So that is the 101 idiot's guide to what a particle accelerator is. So Darsby's link to particle accelerated technology stretches back, like I said, to the 1960s. We're renowned for our work on the design, the construction and assembly of particle accelerators and synchrotrons, which allow the scientists to study a diverse range of things, whether it's a fossil or a jet engine, to a virus or a vaccine. It's undertaken world leading research in different fields, including accelerator science and physics, computational science, which may be things like biomedicine, chemistry and material science, but crucially, the NGO and expertise that underpins all of the things I've mentioned there. Now, Darsby's work in these areas has contributed to many great things, including research into diseases such as HIV and AIDS. Um, the magnetic memory that was in an iPod when they were kicking around, that was a result of the work that we've done, for example. The work at Darsby has also contributed to um, three Nobel Prizes as well in science. So over the course of the evening, you're going to see up close for the virtual tour some of the, the key projects that our Engineering Technology Centre is involved with. But just to give you sort of the headlines of some of the, the main things we, we're involved with here at, at Darsby in an engineering sense, one of which is our Compact Linear Accelerator for Research and Applications, or rather SNESLY, known as CLARA. That is our, our in-house particle accelerator located here at Darsby. Um, what it will do is help to develop our next generation proton imaging technology, which will ultimately lead to improved cancer detection and treatment. Um, the work that we're doing is having genuine impact with Clara. It's research with impact, particularly within health and medicine. So um, a lot of the service users that have, have been using Clara for research, um, it's, it's helping to lead to more efficient diagnosis of, of certain cancers. We're also involved in a project called the High Luminosity or High Lumi Upgrade for CERN. CERN is the, the world's largest physics laboratory, which houses the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. Um, the LHC, for those who aren't familiar, it's a 27 kilometer ring of superconducting magnets with a number of different accelerating structures located along the way, boosting the, boosting the particles that go along that. They form two beams that travel in opposite directions, which are then made to collide at four points around the, the machine. And it's producing approximately a billion collisions every second, which, which is quite a lot. But we want it to have more collisions because by generating more collisions, it's generating more data. And we want those collisions to be bigger as well. So one of the things we're doing is, is working on something called crab cavities, which will basically bunch the proton beams like a crab side on. And that creates more surface area, which then creates bigger and more efficient uh, collisions. And that generates more data for the scientists to get the information they need much quicker than they are doing now. We're also involved in something called the European Spallation Source, or ESS, uh, which is under construction at the moment in, in Sweden. And that will be a multidisciplinary research facility based on the world's most powerful neutron source. So effectively acting as a, as a giant microscope to be used for the study of different materials. So what are we doing to help with ESS? Well, there's, there's various work streams we're involved with here at Darsbury, um, one of which is the design of the radio frequency the RF distribution system. RF is the system that's actually used to power the accelerator. And we're also involved in designing, building, and installing the beam transport modules, um, which will actually transport the beam through the accelerator itself. And we're, we're providing approximately 85% of the total length of the accelerator. The good thing about ESS, uh, if we take it down to really basic comparison terms, it will produce a, a hundred times brighter neutron beams than what is currently available at existing science facilities. So again, in more simple terms, it'll be the difference between taking a picture now using candlelight and instead taking that picture with a, with a high power torch next to it. It's, it's that kind of difference that we're looking to make with, with European Spallation Source. 
So why do we evolve, in, evolve ourselves in apprenticeships? Um, well, to do the work that we do, we need the people, which is what I mentioned before. So we need to plan ahead and we need to plan ahead and ensure we've got the right people in the organisation with the right skills to continue to meet the demands of a, of a change in research environment. So part of that is we want to, we want to grow our own. So we want to grow our own talent, we want to develop our own staff with the benefit of creating the skills and capabilities that are needed to then meet tomorrow's scientific challenges and tomorrow's scientific advances. So we've got a long-standing history of being involved with apprenticeships at Darsbury. Um, over 30 years of, of, of apprenticeships we've been offering. And many of our senior colleagues, some of which are pictured here on some quite embarrassing photographs you can see, they've come through the apprenticeship themselves. Um, so we've got approximately 100 staff across STFC and 25 of those at Darsbury in quite senior leadership roles within the organisation who, who themselves have come through the apprenticeship route. So it, it really is a great opportunity to, to train our future leaders within the organisation. So what do we do offer in terms of apprenticeships? Well, the main areas of apprenticeships we tend to focus on are listed here on the screen. Engineering and computing are by far our, our biggest um, offer for apprenticeships because they are where we need the most people to do what we do. But we also offer apprenticeships in a lot of those supporting roles that I mentioned uh, earlier in the slide. So we need lab technicians, we need people to um, look after our IT infrastructure so actually, you know, people can actually go about their jobs and, and do what they need to do. We need people to manage the really complex, expensive projects that we're working on. We need people to help with our marketing communications, and we need help people to help with our events and engagement that we do. And there's many, many more. So, and this the apprenticeship scheme is growing. So, even if you are interested in the work of STFC but don't necessarily see yourself as someone working in a STEM role, there's lots of other roles that you can you can be involved with, which will directly help the work of the scientists and technicians and engineers at STFC. Now, as an apprentice at STFC, what we'll try and do is, is give you ex maximum exposure to all different areas of the organisation, because we're quite a complex organisation, we've got quite a complex structure, and each one of our departments is doing something quite niche and quite interesting. So for us, to give you exposure to that is a massive benefit, because it helps you with your own um, development. So that will help you to kind of find your niche, find what your interests are, and then help to shape and mould your future career uh, as you grow within the organisation. One of the other benefits we have being um, part of an international collaborative organisation, you know, working with organisations such as CERN, working with organisations such as European Spallation Source, and you've probably all heard of La Palma in recent news on the Canary Islands. We, we've, we've also got a facility based over there too, the Isaac Newton Group of Telescopes. What it means is that we can offer um, extensive international placements for our apprentices. So every year, COVID, COVID allowing, we, we arrange for our apprentices to go on a fully funded uh, placement, working at any of these institutions, anything up to seven weeks. And what you're doing there is working hands-on in those facilities alongside people from lots of different organizations and lots of different cultures. So you get to live there, you get to live and breathe the culture, and it's really good for your personal development. And individuals that come back from those placements, we see a marked change in sort of their demeanor and their confidence and they carry that forward with them within, as they develop within the organization as well as building new networks and potentially new, new future job opportunities as well. So I just want to focus a little bit on the engineering apprenticeships seeing as that's what the main focus of this evening is. Um, we tend to offer engineering apprenticeships in, in three main disciplines, um, mechanical, electrical and electronic engineering. Um, almost 70% of all of our apprentices at Darsbury are based in an engineering or, or a technical role in some capacity. Now we offer two different pathways for our engineering apprenticeships at STFC, but they're very similar in terms of their structure. And this quite complicated slide, to be fair, just gives you a general overview of the pathway you will follow as an engineering apprentice. So within your first year of your apprenticeship, what we'll, what we'll seek to do is to really embed um, some good engineering principles to then use from your second, third and fourth year of your apprenticeship. So in your first year, you'll spend the first year full time off site at our training facility located at Northwest Training Council in Liverpool. And what that there, regardless of the discipline of engineering you're following, you'll learn about engineering across all disciplines. So you'll learn about mechanical principles. You, you'll be able to weld and fabricate and turn a mill, for example. You'll learn about programming. You'll learn about electronics. You'll learn about electrical circuitry and all that kind of, that goes with it as well. And you'll be trained on how to use equipment uh, and, and machinery safely in a controlled environment. You'll also start to complete your first technical training, your test technical certificate, which may be a BTEC level three in engineering 
or depending on your prior qualifications in your joint, it could be a higher national certificate in your relevant engineering discipline. As you progress in years two, three and four, you'll, you'll be based full time on site at Darsby, but you'll continue with, with day release off the job learning with your technical training. So that whether you continue with your BTEC or your, or your higher national certificate and years three and four, you'll then progress on to uh, your, your next higher level technical qualification, which may be a, a H, HND or a HNC, again, depending on the uh, prior qualifications you enter with. All of this forms the underpinning of the Science Industry Maintenance Technician Standard, which is the apprenticeship standard you'll be, you'll be working towards. And that will develop all of the key knowledge, skills, behaviours you will require to work as an effective technician within the science industry. So it's all about engineering and technical skills, but in a very controlled scientific environment. And that is the, the, the standard you will undertake um, with our partners at Northwest Training Council. At the end of your training period, you then go through a gateway, which is basically in, ensuring that you've had the opportunity to develop all your knowledge and consolidate that through on the job pra practice and projects. And then you go through an independent endpoint assessment, which is essentially verifying that you are competent in your role and that it's giving you an additional level of recognition. Beyond that, there's opportunities to progress onto further development. So we deliberately construct this apprenticeship in such a way that it does bolt directly into a, a level six degree apprenticeship. So there is opportunities to progress and achieve a full Bachelor of Engineering's degree, fully funded through the apprenticeship route as well. And that's something that some of our apprentices are undertaking on, on the call tonight or will be undertaking um, in, in the future. And a final thing I want to add as well, in terms of the wireless support we offer for apprentices, we do have an apprentice association which was launched last year. And the idea behind the Apprentice Association is it's, it's run by apprentices and it's run for our apprentices. And what we want to do is we want to ensure that all of our apprentices have a voice. We do genuinely listen to what the apprentices say and where there's opportunities for improvement or where there's opportunities to make changes to our apprenticeship offer, offer or opportunities to further support our apprentices. We rely on our apprentices bring that information forward. So the Apprentice Association was established as a formal means to, to, to get that information from the apprentices. So it, it, it has two chairs, Izzy and Dan. You'll hear from Dan later on this evening as he goes around the tour. And there's a number of other support roles in there as well. And what the association seeks to do really is a few things. So one of it is facilitate and improve communication amongst the apprentices because we've got quite a diverse scheme. You know, there's 61 different apprentices working in lots of different roles in different departments. So we want them to be able to network and speak to each other and support each other as well as socialise and make some great friendships along the way. It will help them to develop some activities kind of outside the workplace as well. So it might be charitable events and raising money, social events, for example. But it also provides a more targeted you know, peer support and mentoring opportunities so that so the apprentices can actually mentor each other and support each other, which is something they do anyway, naturally. This is giving them a, a, a more formal forum to actually do that. And they also produce things like quarterly newsletters, so you know what they've been up to, some of their key achievements, and they really celebrate the success of our apprentices. And the Apprentice Association is one of those things that, that, that we do. So that's, that's all from me. This is probably the opportunity moment now just to hand over to, to Dan, who you can see on the screen there is one of the, the co-chairs of the association. And he'll just tell you a little bit more about um, what the association does. Hi guys, uh, I'm Dan. As a, the top that you can see on the right. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently the, one of the co-chairs of the Apprentice Association. And uh, like Jonathan said, it's, um, Ran by apprentices for apprentices. Um, I'm currently in my last year of my apprenticeship, um, and my co-chair Izzy, she's just finished hers last year. Um, she was in a um, office-based role, and um, I was a technical-based role. Uh, so you've got like you've got a representative from both sides, basically. So you can uh, so everyone gets their sort of voice, um, and. Uh, we pretty much just we act as a middleman, so, so to speak, as like between the higher ups, like the big dogs, who um, they're actually they're not intimidating to talk to. But when you first come on site as an apprentice, and you're not you're not the most confident in the world, because everyone is at some point. It you know it's nice to have somebody there who can uh, sort of like bridge the gap for you, and you can relay the information to them, and they can give it to them, and back and forth, and. Um, all of the chairs are, and people in the uh, association are normally voted in. So you choose the people to be there. So it's not just like someone's forced on you. You know, it's, it's like a group thing and everyone works together nicely. Um, 
And then the only other thing is it's it's not just a time and work that we all spend together doing a uh, friend association stuff. We do uh, social activities stuff like, that. like uh, obviously COVID's put a big of a bit of a hit to that as of uh, as of late, but it's started to get better. Um, we can go for uh, drinks quite a lot, which is quite nice. Um, we've we've actually got an, uh, something that happened on Friday conveniently, uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it for me. Um, yeah, we're there for the apprentices. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll be all. I'll be hanging on at the end as well for Q and A. So any questions you know related to the apprenticeship scheme, I'll be I'll be here to kind of help answer those questions. Thanks everyone. And I'll take over from there. Thank you for that, Jonathan. So <clears throat> I am Thomas Kelly. Um, I'm an electrical um, engineer. Um, I started as an apprentice. I've been with the lab now for, we're just totaling up today, eight years, um, which seems to have flown over. So uh, I'll be leading the 360 section of the tour, um, which is going to be centered around the Engineering Technology Center, which is where the people who will be speaking tonight um, operate from. So quick background on who we are. We have all, the people who are going to be speaking have either been or currently are apprentices. Um, this tour will be led mainly by mechanical and electrical technicians, but we appreciate there is actually, you know, a number of different disciplines, as you've heard from Jonathan, um, within not only this building, but also across site. Uh, we've all had a similar start. We all have a similar background and um, within engineering. Uh, we, we, you know, spent the first year going to the same um, colleges and both studying alongside doing mechanical and electrical training. And we all generally enjoy our work, I think it's fair to say. So this is the site, this is Darsby Laboratory. Um, the large white tower at the top that you can see um, is tends to be a local landmark. So we're not so far away from Liverpool Airport and that tends to be a turning point um, for aircraft. It stands about hundred meters in height and glows blue at night. So it's, it's, what, we're, it's, it's what our local landmark is. It's, it's what's our easily recognizable feature. Across the site, we've got a number of different buildings and facilities. So these are um, for combining um, STFC alongside business and helping to, um, incubate and grow small businesses into, into larger establishments. And that's using some of the resources and some of the, um, basically some of the know-how that we, we've gained over, you know, the 50 plus years of the site being in operation. And in the top right, this is the Engineering Technology Center. So this is where we're based. That's where the, the uh, tour will be taken. So the Engineering Technology Center, just a uh, better explain of what it is. The idea is to locate as much technology, tools, and infrastructure as possible into one building to help make science engineering happen. So there's about 50 people within the building and we cover a vast array of, um, of different um, backgrounds. So we've got electrical design, which is where um, I'm primarily based for the time being. Um, we've got electrical assembly, which we'll take you through. We do specialist clean room assembly for ultra high vacuum components. We do magnet testing and cleaning. We do packaging dispatch, metallurgy research. Um, the amount of in, the, the amount of technology we have within the building is, is frankly incredible. Um, we pack it all into one quite dense space and we tend to make a lot of fantastic science happen. Um, so it's a place that we're quite proud of. And with that, we can take you onto the tour. So I will flip over to this. So this is a 360 view. Um, this is a, a floating camera that's been placed on a pedestal, taking a 360 degree picture, and that allows us to pan around the building uh, and into different areas to give you uh, give people from outside a viewing on you know where we work on a day to day basis. So down ahead, you can see the tower. So the site is based on a, it. It's got a gradient up a hill. So that's the tower that you've seen in, in the distance. Over in this corner is the um, Campus Technology Hub. So within the Campus Technology Hub, it's designed to meet um, high-tech industries needs. So within that building, you can do 3D printing, virtual reality, uh, laser scanning. So it allows industry to tap into just some of the expertise and materials that we have on site. So we're gonna take you uh, into our building, which is here. This is the uh, Engineering Technology Center. So we'll take you through the main tradesperson's entrance. As we come through into the building, the first place that we'll stop at is the electrical integration area. So this is where I, sp I still spend an amount of my time doing um, testing and prototyping. And it's where I spent my, uh, the vast majority of my apprenticeship. 
So you'll have to appreciate that these 360s were taken during a lockdown. So this is as if everybody has down tools and left because essentially that's what happened. So we haven't glossed it up. This is real. Um, this is a day to day view of what the, of what the rooms look like. And as you'll see on the 360 tour, you'll have a up to date view of what the uh, what the rooms look like. So within the electrical integration area, we build control racks and crates. So that's basically sort of the nervous system that goes into the particle accelerators that we have on site. We can also do some simple things like sockets and lights to high voltage installations, um, testing of, of several thousand volt DC power supplies, all can be done within this room. So we can build racks and crates, which have got power supplies and monitoring equipment or equipment that helps generate a vacuum, which is highly important in your accelerator. We can also do crates that help do personal safety systems or control units and junction boxes. So that's about ensuring that the machine operates within its criteria, making sure that people are safe so that there's no people left within the area. We build um, safety systems and boxes that allow, um, allow people to do a sweep of a building, guarantee that the place is clear, and then go through section by section and um, isolate the, the, that section of the machine to make sure that, um, that safety protocols are followed. So we help support that. So it's not just purely electrical. Over here, we've got a mainly mechanical section. So we've got you know pillar drills, hand tools, vices, and a workbench. Um, so that just lets you cut and fabricate some of the metal assemblies that go into making your racks and crates. We have a high voltage test cage that allows us to, in a safe environment, test high voltage power supplies. And then within the center of the room, we have, um, have benches that our technicians work at. So each technician has their own section where they can store their tools and store the materials. Um, you have your own um, enclosed, your own section that you can work from so that you know, you're, not, you're not simply traveling around site trying to, to fault find, fix, fabricate, whatever you need to do. You can have a section that you can call your own and that you can work from. So. We're going to uh, clear mainly out of this room and we're going to go through into the 3D printing room where hopefully we can switch over to Dan and he can show us a little bit about some of the um, FDM machines that we have on site. Hi guys, uh, it's me again. I uh, thought I'd show you the uh, 3D printing room. So all right, let's get started. So we'll start off with the little ones first. Um, video switch so that's just so i can see what's going on uh yeah so we'll start off with the two prusa machines we've got uh we've got this one on the left and this one on the right they're completely identical um they're more used for like our small little jobs um and for like the prototype sort of stuff that um needs to be banged out pretty quickly because say uh, you know you figured that was a pretty big issue with one of the beam vessels and you need a flange holding so you can attach it to the assembly so it's you know it works correctly so say say that happens you need um something made real quick so we'll draw it up on cad um and then we'll put it on the 3d printer print it out and see if it works if it fixes the problem great if not oh well it's not it's not too big of a loss uh so i thought i'd show you uh you know, we've got a little example here uh got a little, little batman logo that we made uh not so long ago. Um, I, I wish I could show you the printers working, but uh, unfortunately they're uh, waiting for calibration, so we can't really use them at the moment. Um, oh, I say at the moment, it's only for the last day or so. Um, but yeah, there's the printers. Um, the main thing we print at the minute is a uh, PLA, just because it's cheap, pretty forgiving. Um, there's not much, too much to it really. Um, and you haven't got to buy too much specialist equipment for it to, for it to work properly. Um, so. Well, uh, I'll, I'll show you the actual enclosure for it. Um, so I'll move on to any of the, like, the nitty gritty details. Uh, this is a, a core enclosure. So this acts as like a, um, a barrier between the fumes given off by the printer and yourself. Uh, because whereas PLA is not the worst thing in the world, some of the fumes you can get off it sometimes are not ideal. Um, and no one's sure as of late what the actual side effects of that might be. So just to keep it safe, uh, we've, we bought these enclosures um, and they basically they've got a HEPA filter and we've got fans on the back and they're all temperature controlled, there's sensors, um, there's fire alarm, we've got a fire extinguisher in the room. So if anything does go wrong, we can pretty much act on it pretty quickly and solve the issue before it gets any worse. Um, yeah, and that's the purpose of those enclosures. Uh, 
I thought I'd show you some of the little, uh, little props and uh, give you a proper idea of what sort of stuff that we use 3D printers for. Um, what you see in front of us here is um, a prototype that we made for holding a uh, gas pipe inside of a uh, gas injection uh, module for one of the accelerators called Phoebe. Um, and what it does is inside this this little like cylinder here is uh, where the gas pipe goes in. And obviously when it gets put under a vacuum, the tube's under quite a large amount of force, which can cause it to, you know, just snap and bend and do God knows what, which which isn't ideal when you're trying to do an experiment because it can ruin the vacuum, it can throw particles into the system, it can just give you not a very nice time to not not, not a very nice day in work basically. Uh, so a way around trying to solve, solve that issue is we rigged up this uh, on the 3D printer and uh, this acts as a little uh, little little clamp for it basically. So we can clamp the flange on this end, uh, stick it inside the vacuum and it will hold everything hopefully nice and steady and uh, we can do the experiments in peace without things going wrong. Um, so that's basically all we use 3D printers for, just for little quick one-offs or sometimes like for example, well, I should talk about then. I, talk, I think it took about eight hours to print, a long time, but it was quicker than trying to machine one. Um, and that's it, really. Uh, I'll show you uh, some of the filaments. This is uh, some of the PLA that we use. Uh, this is the black reel at the moment. Um, so the reason we use PLA rather than, like, say, ABS is obviously one because of the fact that ABS is a lot more damaging to you if you breathe all the fumes in. Uh, and then the second thing is mainly due to the fact that if you use ABS, you need to replace your nozzles more regularly. Um, the nozzles tend to get more clogged. The room's got to be temperature controlled. You've got to take more, uh, navigate back. You've got to take more uh, consideration and forward thinking before you go into um, all the little bits and pieces. Otherwise, things go very quickly, very wrong very quickly with ABS and it won't give you a very nice time. Um, so, right, that's enough about the Prusas. Spoke about them for long enough. We're going on to the big boys. Uh, right here is the, uh, the Meltio. This uh, is the 3D printer that we use to print uh, metal parts, metal components. Um, the way it works is it's, uh, it, it welds like individual little pieces and it welds them in like such a way like and does it in layers that you can build up a whole like 3D model of something um, and it'll all be 3D printed. It'll get sent off to the machine workshop, which you can just see through this window. And then it'll get post-machined and it'll get machined perfectly for tolerance. And then we'll have a perfectly fully functioning product for use on our accelerators without having to send it out a house for, you know, six months whilst it gets machined because some of the shapes can be quite complicated. Uh, and that's pretty much that really. Um, on to the next ones. Uh, we've got, a couple more, well, I say more massive, but they are huge in comparison. Um, more 3D printers. These ones are just plastic ones, like the Prusas behind me. Um, the one on the left, uh, the Raise 3D, uh, that's uh, a dual extruder uh, like a 3D printer, which means you can print two different things at the same time um, because it's got two, uh, two nozzles on it to shoot the plastic out. And... Uh, Basically, what this is used for is for, say, you've got to print like a really complex shape that's basically floating in midair. You can print it using this and you use a certain type of filament that dissolves in water so that you can uh, just simply dip it in water and then you've got rid of the supports and your finish is really nice on your part and all that good stuff. Um, the Epsilon next to us, uh, on the right, should I say, uh, is basically just a much, much, much bigger uh, <laughs> Of a, of a typical 3D printer. Um, this is going to be used for more, more of the bigger projects. So like stuff like what I had in my hand before about the uh, support piece. Um, this was on the Prusas and it was quite hard to get it to fit correctly on the bed because the bed's only about the size of an A4 piece of paper. Whereas if you look at this one, uh, it's, it's not quite A3, but it's, it's not far off. So you've got quite a large amount of room to work with so it allows you to uh, do a lot more complicated jobs, much bigger jobs and just gives you a bit more freedom of what you want to do. 
Um, so I'm going to start finishing this up now. Uh, but I thought I'd show you some apprentice projects that we've uh, had in the works recently, just so you can have an idea of what sort of stuff we get up to and mess about with. Um, in front of me here, this is uh, the uh, gear and fan mechanism that uh, goes on to... It's not finished, so I can't quite uh, show you it in working, but I can show you the idea. Basically, this goes on the back of it, uh, that way around, sorry, <laughs> goes on the back of it. And then what happens is you blow a fan at this end, uh, this end right here, and it spins the spins the blade, and then that causes all these legs, all these legs to move, and it'll start to walk across the table. And uh, just stuff, little stuff like that, little fun little projects like that is what we do on the uh, 3D printers here for the apprentices, just so you can get an appreciation and learn what's going on with them, so you can go on to bigger and better jobs and have a bit of fun along the way. Um, yeah, that pretty much wraps it up for my part on the 3D printers. Um, Hand it back over to Tom. Lovely. Mute audio. <coughs> Mute audio. Right Give me a down for a minute. Cool. So Dan's just taking you through the 3D printer room. Um, I'll just give you a quick view over here of the um, of the more traditional um, milling machines that we have on site. So. On the left hand side, we have um, a number of lathes. I'll take you down to the end of the workshop. So down here, we have a number of lathes. So that's where you insert your part and spin it. So that's typically for uh, rotary forming rolls. Um, so you can place your part within the jaws and then you can take cuts and passes away from that. So that's typically if you need to do a, a piece on a rotary axis. Down the center of the room, we have milling machines. These are manual milling machines. So these are essentially like a pedestal drill where you clamp your part into um, into some jaws, manipulate the part left, right, forwards and backwards. So that allows you to take cuts away from the material. Um, all of this is called subtractive. Um, so you can't, once you've taken your cut, you can't add something onto it. So it's important that you under, the person operating the machinery understands some of the intricacies behind it. They make decisions on how they clamp their components and they make informed decisions on the limitations of the machine. Um, on the right-hand side, we have the CNC machines. They're computer, computer numerically controlled machines. So they are essentially electrical, uh, electronically controlled versions of what you have on the left-hand side. So the manual machines still have a place. You know, some of these machines are 50, 60 years old, but they're still absolutely essential to what we do on site. They can still machine down to very fine tolerances. Um, if you need to do one-off bit part work, then you use the machines on the left. Whereas if you need to do something that's a bit more, uh, whether it's a larger piece or you need to do batch production or something that's quite repetitive, uh, that's when you'd use the CNC machines. So we'll take you through. Uh, what I'd just like to ask is, have we got any questions um, that we, we'll take a break and answer questions now from Claire? Yeah, thank you. We've got a couple. Um, someone asked, and Alex has started to answer this, um, so you showed us the 3D printed gas pipe support and someone asked if it's destined for use in hard vacuum, will it not outgas and degrade the vacuum? So Alex, I don't know if you just want to um, cover your answer there quickly. Uh, yeah, I can do. So you are correct that the outgassing rate from the PLA would be horrific. Um, plastic, especially 3D printed plastics like that under vacuum. There's not a lot of research on them, but the research that does show us in the high vacuum system or ultra high vacuum system, such as an accelerator, um, the outgassing would be detrimental probably to the vacuum system that we were running. However, that particular test, I seem to remember that we were only running a low vacuum, uh, 10 to the minus three, and it was purely just to figure out the position that the gas nozzle needed to be in so we could figure out the gas flow through um, properly. So it was just a pre-production prototype part that allowed us to, to figure out the positioning. If that answers the question. It does. Brilliant. Thank you. And Dan, you talked about uh, ABS and PLA. Can you just quickly, for those of us who don't know, just explain those acronyms? And then somebody has asked, given the problems that you mentioned with ABS, why would anyone use it rather than PLA? Or me Uh, yeah, so um, I can't remember exactly what the uh, the acronym stands for for ABS off the top of my head, um, but I do know what PLA is. Uh, so I'll start off with PLA first. Um, PLA is just a um, 
quick way of saying polyactic acid, which is a type of plastic that's made from cornstarch. Essentially, that's all it is, just a type of plastic. Um, and what it is, is the reason why you print in PLA rather than ABS most of the time, especially for prototypes, is because for a prototype, you're not relying on a product to be you know, strong, sturdy, um, last a long time, hold up very well. Um, so your parts can be typically quite a lot weaker, which is what PLA is. PLA is quite a, it's quite a lot, like quite a much weaker uh, plastic to use for uh, 3D printed parts. Whereas ABS is much sturdier, much uh, more hardware, hardwareing, and it's much better for like um, components that you'd use for, you know, in like moving components. So like you know, if you're making gears, if you wanted it to be a really you know long lasting gearbox. Not like you'd make it out of plastic anyway, but if you were, you'd rather print out of ABS than PLA because the ABS would last much longer. You'd have to replace the gears much less, and it basically just a lot more hardwearing. But the issue with it is that the pretty bad trade-off is it's quite a bit more harmful for you if you breathe it in, which is why we've got those enclosures with the HEPA filters, so it can filter out a bit of that stuff. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's quite a bit more expensive to buy, especially for the high quality filament um, and it's very easy for it to go wrong um, and that's pretty much all I've got for you really hope that answers the question no it does thank you someone's just actually just said is that what Lego bricks is made of um, but I'm, I'm not sure we can answer that unfortunately and um, thank you Suzanne as well who's told us what a ABS stands for so if you go into our answered section on the Q&A you can see that for yourself um, so I'll hand back but if you've got any questions just keep putting them in the Q&A box and we will come back to them as we go along thanks a lot fantastic thanks for that Claire um, so what I'll take you through now is into the clean assembly facility um, this is just the clean rooms that we have within the building. Um, there are clean rooms used across site. They're typically portable clean rooms. So they are a, uh, a set of curtains with a fan unit on top that are on wheels. And you wheel them over the thing that you're interested in keeping clean. But they're sort of like a temporary measure. Um, if we need to do proper assembly work within the ETC in a clean room environment, that's where we would, uh, we would do it in here instead. So I can take you through the doorway into the first section. So you notice you uh, enter into the room, there's uh, a number of blue squares on the floor. So the blue squares are designed to um, remove material that will be on your feet. To enter into this area, you need to put um, essentially a blue carrier bag uh, type device with an elastic band on it. Uh, that goes around your feet. So that stops you from walking contamination into the room. The entire thing that we're concerned about uh, within a clean room environment is trying to keep the particles out. Any particles that are in the room, we minimize and try and contain or capture. Um, and bringing particles into a room is, is generally a no-go. So the, the, the easiest thing to do is stop contamination by, um, by your feet. So you make sure that you put blue bag on when you walk into the area, that's your blue overshoes. So a quick uh, mention on what a clean room is. Um, it's a, if a room that you classify according to the cleanliness level of the air um, that's inside the room. Uh, that's classified from ISO 9 down to ISO 1. ISO 9 is the cleanest, uh, sorry, ISO 9 is the dirtiest clean room, if that was a, a thing to say. Uh, ISO 1 is the cleanest possible clean room. Um, bear in mind that even ISO 9, even though that is a the uh, lowest standard to pass, that is still generally cleaner than most you, you know rooms that people would habitate. And then from there, it, it, it steps up in levels. Um, so the first room here is a is currently being retrofitted. So this is thought of as a semi-clean room. Um, so currently it's going to be reaching the ISO 6 standard as an average. So you'd have to put overshoes on to be in the area and the air within the room is being changed roughly once a minute. Um, so in a traditional room, you, you, know, may, you may change the air two to three times an hour. With this, it's once a minute. So you can already see that we're stepping up in levels. Um, so what we've got here is a warm unit. This is a warm unit for ESS. That generally just means a, a warm unit is a unit you don't have to super, um, you don't have to chill with liquid helium, liquid nitrogen to make it superconductive. So this is basically a transport section that allows a beam to pass from one end down to the other. Um, contained on it is a ion pump. Um, which is used to trap particles that are with stray particles within the beam tube. They're captured and drawn away. Um, this unit is under test. It would have been assembled in the next room, uh, which the 360 tool doesn't go into, but I'll give you a 
quick overview and show you inside that room. So you see there's an outer and an inner room. So within this room, we're talking, the air changes are happening roughly six or seven times a minute. So it's quite an intensive filtration process. The air is brought in at the top of the room, taken out at the bottom of the room. So that's, that cycle encourages any particulates and contaminants to fall down to floor level and be drawn away. The contamination within this room is there should be no particles bigger than five microns. Five microns is the width of um, a length of spider's silk. So we're talking very, very almost imperceptibly small. If to go into this room, you'd have to wear wellies, gown, a mask and gloves. Essentially, all you would see is a pair of eyes. There is a procedure and methodology for entering into the room through an airlock and out. And you don't you don't simply just enter in and out. There is a, a whole process that you have to go through um, to make sure that you're not bringing contamination from the semi clean room right through into the clean room. So I could take you back from there and I'll take you on the three back to the 360 and take it into the magnet testing area. Um, so we can hand so Within the magnet testing area, this is a specialist area that's set up to um, allow you to test permanent uh, magnets. Permanent magnets come with their own risks. Um, obviously, any metals within the room would be attracted to it. And some of the magnets we're dealing with are several Tesla in strength. That means that it could remove a tool from your hand at, let's say, half a meter's distance, stick it to whatever permanent magnet was in the room, and you're going to be hard pressed to, uh, to get that part out of uh, getting it away from the magnet. If you're entering into this room, you can't have any um, any implants, hearing aids. Um, if you've got credit, debit cards and phones, they all have to be left in a locker outside to make sure that you don't damage the um, don't. Well, if you damage yourself, if you have an implant or damage your phone um, or anything that was in your pockets. I could take you from that room. We're going to take you further down the uh, further down the building and we're going to take you to the module assembly area where hopefully Jordan is with a 360 camera. She can take you through some of the modules that are assembled within here. Hello. Um, so I'm currently in the survey room, uh, which is temperature controlled. Um, so it's kept around 21 degrees um, to help us when we're uh, using a laser track to survey all our modules that we've built up. Um, we do this in a controlled environment so that we um, don't have any movement between any of the components um, due to differences in temperatures. Um, so one of the assemblies with um, so YAG is it stands for yttrium aluminium garnet. Uh, it's basically a really fancy camera lens uh, that we use on our particle accelerators uh, to ensure the laser stays within a certain tolerance. Um, I'll show you a complete one over here. Um, so this is the YAG. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see in there, um, but there's a little, oh, a little grid um, and also a little disc, which basically controls uh, or tells us, navigate back. Uh, basically tells us where the laser is hitting on the um, on the disc, and then the scientists can adjust the laser to ensure it stays central uh, throughout. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Ed outside now, if that's okay. <laughs> Mute audio. Start video. Start video. Okay. Hello? Start my video. Start my video. All right, sorry about that. Hello, so I'm in the um, rack build area at the back of ETC. This is where us electricians build racks uh, where we can put so this is one that's partially being built at the moment. It's got PLCs or programmable logic controllers and um, we've got power supplies and redundancy modules and um, you know, terminal blocks. That These are like the hubs of all the racks that we will have in a rack sub so to take all the data in and out to control all the power supplies, etc. So here we've got four of our power supplies. Um, 
that control the quadrupole electromagnets that accelerate the electrons down the accelerator. These units are the 60 volt, 100 amp for a total of 60 kilowatts of power. And one of my one of my roles is to test these power supplies. Um, so two of the main power tests we do are we do a stability test, which is you'll see here, where what we'll do is we see how much the current of the output deviates over eight hours. We're not so much concerned about the um, how close the current is to the set point, but how little it changes over time. So we want precision over accuracy. Um, uh, another test we carry out is a ripple test. Um, so when the power supplies convert alternating current to direct current, it's very hard to get rid completely get rid of all of the oscillation in the power. So um, what remains is referred to as ripple. Um, and we need to know how what ripple there is so we know exactly, well, how much power, what current we will actually be getting out of the power supply. And because we don't want to set it to what 93 amps and it ripples between 94 and 95 because we won't be getting 93 amps. So, um, yeah, so we try and get the ripple for our power supplies to be um, within 25 ppm. Now, our ppm stands for parts per million, which basically, in terms of if you imagine a percentage being one in a hundred, one ppm is one in a million. So it's a very, very small um, unit. So we have to get make up, make sure that they're very accurate and they do exactly what we want them to do. So the scientists know when they set a power supply to a certain current that they get, that that's the current they get. And that's it from me. Awesome, thanks for that, Ed. Um, so where I'll take you now is through to the um, vacuum lab that we have on site. <clears throat> so enter into it through the uh, doors here. So what we're essentially seeing um, is the, the vacuum cleaning process. This is where it takes place. This is sort of the process. You're almost seeing the second half of it. Um, so the main body of the work is done in here. But, um, as we're walking through the building, I'll, I'll talk you through uh, this section that you're looking at here. So inside accelerators, you need to maintain an ultra high vacuum. So that's roughly one time 10 to the nine millibars. So we're talking very, very, very low pressures. In order to do that, we need to minimize thermal outgassing and remove water and any other traced gases that would be sitting inside of our particle accelerators. So any components, be it cavities, beam tubes, anything that is within contact of that vacuum, we need to make sure that it is as clean as we can get it. Um, we need to remove contaminants and stop the pressures. Um, if, if there was any contaminants within that, it may be that we can't reach the pressure whatsoever. Um, so because, we, because we're trying to catch stray particles to get down to these low vacuum levels, if you're outgassing at a rate faster than you can capture the particles, that means you will never get down to the pressures that you're looking to get to. So this is the bake out process that you're looking at here. So on the left hand side, um, you would have a cover. This is an oven, essentially. The covers for the oven are sat here. You'd crane in your quite heavy component, be it a beam tube or um, any large unit, lay it out on the table. You'd attach a pipe to it to start drawing a vacuum. You would then cover it over to basically contain that part and make um, the oven that you're going to bake the, the components in, and draw the vacuum and turn the temperature up. So you need to get it to over 100 Celsius, heat it as uniformly as possible, and you need to hold it there for eight hours or longer. That encourages all the particulates to leave the surface. You then capture the particulates through a vacuum pump and you monitor um, the contaminants that are coming out. So you're looking for any trace oils um, and hydrocarbons um, that you can then use to look back through your process to understand where you've potentially introduced contamination. Um, it all builds a picture of how clean your part is and what is actually contaminating the part. So you can improve your processes. You can improve your process from what's um, happened before on that section. In the other corner is a thing called a vacuum workhorse. So this is an oven where you load a part in if you're interested in cleaning the outside of it. So you load it into the oven, shut the door, increase the temperature up to 200, 300 degrees if need be. And then you draw a vacuum from the outside of the part. So it's the same process. Um, it's, it's only when you're interested in the external um, elements of a part. 
behind us, we've got a storage rack. So once the parts are complete, uh, or they've gone through the cleaning process, we could then wrap them in a tin foil um, that makes sure that no contaminants can enter back onto the part once you've cleaned it. Um, and if it's a tube, you can cap off the ends with plastic caps. So that just means that your parts that you do, you can basically build a backlog of them so you can clean them, put them into storage, and then you may remove them two or three years later to inst uh, install them on the accelerator. So that lets you get ahead of the curve. And you can we uh, do parts for both our site and also for other sites because we've got some very specialist equipment that we use within this room. Um, so we possibly hand over to Alex to discuss the, uh, the other sides. This is mainly pressure washing and solvent cleaning baths. Yeah. So as Tom said, we have our bake out and our thermal cleaning processes, but really what we want to do before we get to that point is ensure that there is no surface contamination of any kind on any of our vacuum components. So we have a, a cleaning procedure that allows us to get from your standard workshop level component as it would be straight off a machine uh, to its uh, the correct level of cleanliness that we would require. So that starts off um, with a hot water jet, which is mixed with detergent, um, which you can sort of see in the metal grid straight in front of the middle of the screen. So that is effectively a normal kind of jet washer. Uh, from there, we can also do surface stripping, uh, which we have another machine for. Uh, again, that can remove any bonded surface contamination that might come off with heat. We then have a series of solvent ultrasonic baths, such as the big stainless steel one you can see in front of you. We then use them to remove any fine oils, trace oils, trace contamination that's left on the component. From there, they are then rinsed again with demineralized water. And if necessary from the solvent cleaning process, they can be immersed in a hot alkaline bath to, um, to like get the pH back to normal. Uh, from there, they'll be rinsed in demineralized water again. That will ensure that they are then free of any alkaline contamination. So we will introduce small amounts of contamination from the solvent and alkaline cleaning processes. So then we need to get rid of that, which we use the deem in. Um, and then they are dried in a specialist built drying cabinet, which allows us to ensure that they are free of nearly all possible contamination any physical contamination before they go for thermal cleaning, which as Tom said, will remove any final contamination that might be left over. With that, I'll hand back over to Tom. Lovely, thanks for that, Alex. Um, so as we've left the VAC lab, which is here, um, what's left in the building is mainly a general assembly area. Um, so we're assembling parts for um, predominantly ESS, but also, as mentioned, the, uh, the high Lumi upgrade. We have a large uh, crane that we can use to move some of the materials around the shop so the crane can hold 10 tons so you're looking at the weight of a london double decker bus that we're able to you know use to lift and maneuver materials in and out of the out of the workspace uh, and that builds up the main body of, of the workshop as you look down this hand, uh, this side of the building so i'm conscious of uh, where we are on time so i'd like to ask claire if we've got any any questions uh, to close out with we have, thank you. Um, everyone's still with us and we have got a few questions. So I think I'll start with um, a couple. So I've got a couple for you, Tom, actually, about the clean rooms, and then I'll go over to Jonathan for some more career focused ones. So we've had a couple of questions about the clean room. Um, can you just quickly explain what the different iOS levels for the clean rooms would be used for. So what would you do in an iOS 9 clean room, for example, versus what you would do in an iOS 1? And then a follow-up question um, is asked, would, would we at Darsbury be able to do space industry work in our clean rooms? So could we assemble space qualified electronic equipment? I know we do that at UK ATC up in Scotland and at RAL Space um, down, down in Oxfordshire, but specifically at Darsbury, if you could, that would be lovely, thank you. Sure. I think it might be one um, that Alex is a bit better place for, but um, <laughs> on the on the space front, I know we have um, accreditation for our electrical, uh, sorry, electronic soldering. Um, so our technicians there are trained to the same level as those that be working on um, spacecraft. We don't do, uh, we don't process space work. Um, that is mainly down um that's more Oxford's uh, with their new um, space facility that they're building there. I don't see any particular reason why our clean room wouldn't qualify, but I'd have to ask, uh, I'd have to turn that over to Alex to confirm that. 
Uh, yeah, so in theory, a clean room is a clean room. So as long as it's certified to the correct ISO standard for whatever application that they would be working towards, then there's no reason why we couldn't. Uh, but as Tom said, we have a specific department in Oxfordshire called RAL Space, which is, and we have UK ATC as well. And across the two of them, they are, uh, it's their job for satellite and space systems, and they will have their own clean rooms. Um, we do get work from RAL Space that comes in through the vacuum lab and goes into our clean rooms, but it's more of a rare occurrence. Um, it depends what the kind of thing they're working on. As for the ISO standards, ISO 9 through to ISO 1, it really, the, the number just determines the amount of particles that are allowed in your clean room at any one point. So an ISO 9 clean room is more, a lot more lenient and where you can have a larger amount of particles in your room as opposed to ISO 1. So it gets to a point on the ISO standards that it needs to be so clean that you have to remove the person out of the room because the person in the room sheds enough particles that it falls over the standard. Um, so yeah, the number it just relates to how how clean it is. ISO one being sp spotless, ISO three being ISO f ISO three, ISO four being sort of the maximum you can achieve without, with, or sorry, with a person still in the room. Any ISO two, ISO one, you need you need no one in there, kind of thing. If that makes sense. Thank you. That's really good. Um, Jonathan, a couple of questions for you. Um, these are kind of going a little bit beyond our apprenticeship scheme. So somebody has asked if we, is there an upper age limit for our early careers opportunities? In general, no, there's, there's no age cap. The only thing we have to take in consideration when we're looking at an apprenticeship role is your existing qualifications. So generally the way that um, when we're kind of tied by uh, government funding rules on that one. So for example, if you were looking to join us as an engineer and apprentice, if you already hold a bachelor's of engineering or, match, or master's in engineering in particular, the, the apprenticeship funding wouldn't, wouldn't cover that, unfortunately, it's basically double funding. However, we do have graduate schemes. Um, I'm not involved in a graduate scheme, but I know the individuals who are involved with that. Uh, I think you may have posted the link for the careers page earlier, Claire, in the, in the chat. So if you have a look on the, on the career site, there is a dedicated page for our apprenticeships, but there's also one for the graduate scheme. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers and clarifies that question for people. I'll repost that in a second as well. Another question um, is about uh, the roles for more experienced engineers. So I guess if we turn that to what we're saying about apprentices, the question would be, once you've gone through your apprenticeship, what are the more senior roles that you can expect to, to become available um, at STFC and at Dalsby specifically? Yeah, I can answer that from my perspective. So one of the one of the big driving factors for us investing so heavily in our apprenticeship scheme, and, and people won't mind me saying this because they've said it themselves, is that we do have quite an aging workforce. So we've got a lot of experience and knowledge, but unfortunately it's it's built up for a number of years of experience. And naturally, as a result of that, these are individuals that are now starting to think about retirement over the next few years or so. So for, for what it means is for our apprentices and any early careers person coming through our development programmes, we are looking to those individuals to become the more senior people of the future. So we do have our own personal development plans, all staff have access to. And as part of what we look at someone's career progression opportunities and we look at what we need to do to help them to progress. But absolutely, um, we invest heavily in learning and development and, and personal development with the view that early careers people will move into more senior roles um, over the coming years. Can you just explain as well, you did answer this in the chat. Someone asked the question about T levels and how they're gonna fit in with the apprenticeship scheme. Can you just kind of in 60 seconds, give us an overview? I'll try. So T, le <laughs> T levels, for those who don't know, it's gonna be the alternative to A level. So for those people who want to go on to further education and training post 16, but not necessarily for your pure academic A level route, so a T-level will provide a A-level equivalent qualification called a T qualification. So it's a technical qualification um, along with work experience as well. So it's classroom combined with, with work experience. So it's like a mini apprenticeship effectively is the best way to explain that. So we've been looking at T-levels as a possible progression route for, for individuals to come into our apprenticeship programme, potentially at higher level as well, mapping it into higher level apprenticeships. And we're also looking at how we can get involved with offering the mandatory work experience element that's needed 
to gain a T-level qualification for individuals who then potentially may be wanting to apply for apprenticeship opportunities when they've completed that T-level. Hopefully that's answered that in 60 seconds. Well done, you passed the test. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to hand back to Alex. Someone asked how many people we have at Darsbury. I'm going to say 500 ish i'm not entirely sure but you know we are a growing workforce um we're on the site at darsby campus as well so we've got a load of other really vibrant stem-based businesses around us so it is a really great place to work and um, the final question alex which um segues nicely back to you is about the recording for today so i'll hand you back thank you i'll just get my powerpoint back up so the power this the sorry the webinar is recorded and will be available on the Mersey and Western Cheshire uh, YouTube channel. Um, if you do not or cannot find the channel, please email me in the email address on screen. Um, again, if you cannot get the CPD certificate to work, um, then again, email me and I'll send that over to you. The CPD link is in the chat uh, for those of you that want CPD certificates. And the link for the SDFC careers and apprenticeships page is also in the chat for anyone that would like further information or to reiterate anything that's been covered by uh, any of us today. And with that, I think that's everything. So thank you very much for your attendance and staying with us. I know we've overrun by uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, um, but your attendance is greatly appreciated. So thank you for sticking with us. We hope you've enjoyed the tour, the virtual tour and any feedback would be um, greatly appreciated so you can either send that to me by the email address or there will be an automated link that we threw in the next uh, couple of days or so um, and with that thank you very much uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and we shall see you again soon for the next Mersey and Western Cheshire event thank you very much